Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm so excited to have repeat offenders, Jimmy and Irene Rollins with us. Guys, thank you so much for agreeing to be back on the podcast. Thanks Absolutely. For Thanks us. for having us. We are excited. Uh, so last time we talked, you guys were both separate. Now we're together. We're talking about your marriage book. And as I was kind of opening up the book, one of the things that really struck out, uh, st stood out to me, words are hard, um, is is the dedication page that you wrote to your kids. Mm -hmm. It's wow. um, it's a, it's a full page, so I'm not going to read it, but uh, it, it's, it's a confession of who you guys are as parents. It's a love letter to them. Tell me about that moment when you shared um, those words with them. Sure. We put it on our, our audio book up on the screen and uh, played it through the speakers. So they heard my voice reading it to them. And I think that was so imp impactful to them. It really went straight to their heart and they began to weep. And we all cried as a family wow. and thanked God for the miracle that we are, my, my husband and I are still together and that our kids are literally the fruit, living in the fruit yeah. of that hard season. Like God really turned it around for good. They have fallen in love with Jesus and the church through the, this, through this experience. Wow. Yeah. And I think one of the things I was talking to my son, uh, who's 22 yesterday, uh, with some other young adults and telling them the journey of how hard it was that we had passed down to them addiction and fighting not in a good way and not a good version of church and not a good version of character and integrity for so many years through our marital stuff. And then I said, well, here's the turnaround thought. We also passed around, passed down redemption and reconciliation and recovery. And I think that you know, we we have we quote these scriptures that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, but you can't know the power of his resurrection without the fellowship of his suffering. Hmm. And so, yes, we told them how to suffer well and how to recover and which one is stronger. I would say that resurrection power is so much stronger than the things that we go through. One of the things that's beautiful about your story is that now you're telling your marriage story with some time, right? Like I, I think um, from my notes, like 2015 was when this all kind of really came to a head for you guys. And we're almost at that 10 year mark. I, I, how did you guys know that it was the right time to start uh, talking about this in such a public and, and let's be honest, this is a raw book. It's not, it's not a, you know, it's not canned, right? It's very raw right. and vulnerable and real how did you guys know this was the right time? Well, for me, it was 2015. I hit rock bottom. Uh, I ended up in rehab. I was pastoring a church with my husband right. and uh, in Baltimore. Um, nobody knew what was going on in our dysfunction and our pain, but our pastors did and our um, board did. And they sent me away to get help at uh, rehab. And what ended up happening at that rock bottom moment was that we built this foundation of health yeah. from mm -hmm. them then forward. So two years and three months later, I felt like I had the credibility enough in my sobriety to go public with my sobriety. Yeah. Our church exploded in growth from that moment on. Wow. Like people were like, oh my gosh, if she can get sober, I can do it too. If she can heal of trauma, mm -hmm. I can do it too. So I knew that that same thing would happen as we did the work in our marriage we would build credibility and strength to withstand the warfare that comes yeah. with going public. And um, we wanted to be able to give people something that was proven that we had worked. Yeah. So we're not done though. We're, we no. work on this every single day. We're not perfect at it. I think, and we always preach this scripture as leaders, you know, that uh, uh, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Right. Well, I think that that word testimony, we all know this is, it means God do it again. And in order for God to do it again, we have to testify. We have to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think that is gripping the church and gripping leaders is shame mm -hmm. uh, and also um, grace. We, you know, we don't have grace for leaders who, who are going through things. We don't, you know, like we don't have accountability. Like, you know, it's like, if I'm, if I'm honest, it's kind of like an occupational hazard, right? Like 
I'm going to get fired or I'm going to get, but I think we have to, as leaders, have the kind of grace uh, for one another through truth and honesty. So if you can't be truthful and honest and tr and to a trusted source, like it, it's a recipe for disaster and dysfunction and affairs and all the things that are church culture is plagued with that are stopping people from come to ch from coming to church. I don't think people are looking for perfection. I think people are looking for authenticity. Mm -hmm. And what our why our church exploded is we just decided to be authentic and we thought that it's now time for God to do it again through what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And we we can sum all that up and say the enemy can't remind us with what we're already talking about. Mm -hmm. You talked about grace. I think that's a really important thing for a lot of leaders to wrestle with because I think that that grace idea is, is foreign. H how do you guys recommend building the grace muscle for the leaders that are listening? Because, the, you know, the, the other side of grace is truth. And like there's uh, this accountability and all of that. And, you know, a lot of the a lot of the leaders who are listening are faced with some really big um, objectives. And so, how, yeah. you know you're failing, but also I want to be graceful and like, ah, what do we do with that? How do we build that muscle? I like to look at it this way. You, uh, you become what you repeatedly do. Mm. So if you, that's why I love recovery. And I think recovery applies to us all. So if we are all admitting on a regular basis in a safe space yeah, and pastors need pastors too, and counseling and all of the things, being intentional about those things. And you get to be honest and learn how to be honest. If let's say I had a problem yeah. being honest, I didn't have grace for myself. So in those safe spaces, I began to practice having grace for myself and getting honest. Once I did that, now you have some, this counselors have something to work with. That's why we were able to keep our situation private and our church continued to grow while we were on sabbatical mm -hmm. because we were behind the scenes doing work and really learning how to have grace for ourselves. That's this it. Grace is not just for the people we're preaching to. This That's grace good. applies to us. Yeah. yeah. And I had such a hard time as a leader, uh, like receiving the grace of God for myself. And it was one day when I realized I'm cheapening the work of the cross when I don't receive the grace that God Jesus died for for me. Yeah. And so I postured myself admitting my weakness, receiving his grace. Second Corinthians 12, 9. When we admit our weakness, the power and the that's when grace comes that's in great. and gives us the strength. You're such a preacher. To work out <laughs> our healing and our recovery process. But you can't do that until you admit your issues and then receive the forgiveness from God. And then the confession to people is where we get Love healed. That. That's so good. Uh, I, I'm always curious when I see a couple like you guys that are working together, like you guys, you guys do coaching together. You wrote this book together. Talk to me about the process of not killing your spouse while writing a book or reading the audio book or do it. I mean, like, cause you guys are both big <laughs> personalities. Real. I, I yeah. love you both individually. Your work is amazing together. Uh, I think my wife and I would kill each other. Yeah. I, I think it's, again, it's a grace. If I'm honest, like the, some of the tools that we give in the book, like, it's just not our story, but like the tools of how we do this. So it's a great question is we are two completely different people. And, you know, our goal is no longer to think alike. Our goal is to think together. Mm. And so with that being the foundation of how we do life, not just podcasting, not just books, not just all the things traveling and speaking. Irene has a part of her, her strengths are my weaknesses and my strengths are her weaknesses. And I think one of the things we say in the book, like awareness of your spouse's strength is not the absence of your own. Mm -hmm. And I think when we have that mentality, it's easy to work together. I'll be honest with you. We didn't get in one argument right in this book. Wow. This is like real stuff. We yeah. don't, we don't, we, I'm so, and I think what Irene says, I know what I'm not. Yeah. And most leaders won't admit what they're not. So they're overcompensating. And that overcompensation then dominates the marriage or dominates work. And I just know what I'm not like, so I don't need to 
put a comma on what she just explained. She's a good speaker. She thinks of things that I don't think of and I don't need to then add on to like, that was amazing. Great period. Next question. Right. So like, I think just having grace that I'm not all that having grace that I don't have to answer all the questions because there was a time in our marriage that I did. Well, you were the boss at work. You were the lead pastor, right? Yeah. And we weren't co-leading together yet. And, um, and when we adopted that concept, we began to lead the church together. Yeah. He always presenced me and always said, J Irene and I, Irene and I, Irene and I, and then we knew which lane was ours. Mm. So I had final say in HR matters. I had a final say in certain things and he had final say in his thing. We just honor the lines. We don't get it perfect. So we, but it's the whole thing that we talk about in the book about leveraging your strengths and weaknesses. And when you master that, then yeah. there's such a harmony in working together because you're not fighting to be right. You're not, we want to be understood. We've learned that it's part of our DNA because of the practice and the repeat of that. So I think one of the gifts of, of kind of hitting that rock bottom place is that you're forced to do the work. There yeah. are a lot of couples who aren't at rock bottom. They're kind of in like mediocre middle, right? They're mm -hmm. not like thriving, but they're, they're just like keeping their head just above water. If you're talking to that couple and they don't know what their strengths and weaknesses are, how do you, um, how do you coach them into like finding out what those are when there's three kids or four kids at home and they both got jobs and sports, so much sports, right? How do we, yeah. how do we figure that out? So I feel like the intentionality yeah. is everything. So, Hey, you're, you got to get creative. You're driving down the road. That's why we love our coaching. Um, two equals one.com. You can find out more about our coaching. We do a 20 minute segment where that you can listen to or while you're driving or watch with your spouse at different times, then like schedule a time that you come together to discuss what you watched. Mm. And then we have the audio book mm -hmm. option. You're driving, you can listen, you're getting ready in the morning, you can listen to these tools. Um, it's all about getting it in and practicing it as much as possible. And then once a month, we like tonight, we have a um, our one hour uh, live, live Q&A. So we will discuss the topics that we've had teachings on. And, you know, you, couples are like, oh, well, I'm going to be at a soccer game. We'll put your um, earphone in or listen to it later, the Q&A. So it's like you're getting to hear it and learn in, from um, like different ways. You have to see it, read it, see it through uh, the camera, hear it through your all your senses. Yeah, I think that's the key with our coaching is that they get a monthly video that they can watch anytime. We used to do it all live. And then our feedback was, is we can't do it because we got kids, we can't. So we've made it available to basically anybody. And I think what you said uh, is so key because so many people think, oh, I don't need counseling and I don't need coaching. You know, uh, our marriage isn't that bad. Yeah. Well, like, yeah, your, your car is running great up to 3,000 miles, 2,999 miles, but every 3,000 miles you get an oil change, mm -hmm. right? Like, and I think that, uh, why would you plan monthly to get an oil change and not plan to work on your marriage? Yeah. It's like, let's preemptively, yes. let's preemptively do the work so that when the, cause life is going to happen. Life is going to happen. We always say it this way. Life never stops lifing. Mm -hmm. Right. And so just, Amen. just every marriage is dealing with transition. Yeah. Like we're teaching couples how to navigate when the kids go to college, yeah. uh, when the kids go to elementary school, what do you, what does your marriage look like when you disagree, when your son is not getting time on the basketball team and the dad is going crazy and the wife is like, settle down. How do we navigate those things? Those aren't yeah. rock bottom moments, but they could turn into rock bottom moments yeah. without the tools. Yeah. That's so good. And one of the things I appreciate about you guys is in the book, the acknowledgement session is full of couples who have just walked alongside of you guys. Like, it's like this counseling center and this counseling center and this senior pastor. I was like, oh man, this acknowledgement is robust. How important mm -hmm. has community been for you guys getting to where you are today? Uh, it's everything. You cannot do it alone. No, absolutely not. And if Jimmy had not gotten honest with our pastor, 
we would not have had the privacy to deal with our issues and we could have lost everything. Yeah. And it was, it's the community in recovery. It's the community in building marriage tools. It's the community. It's like, we can be leaders and not have our own small group. Mm. We, we, we want everybody in our church to join a small group, but we won't do that for ourselves. Guilty. So like, we, <laughs> yeah, with two equals one, we just, what, what we've learned is like, we create, find the safe space. There are retreats. There are all kinds of things. If you don't want, if you want privacy and, um, you know, uh, anonymity, you can find small groups. There are celebrate recovery pastors, wives, small groups for addiction that are so private. And I've been a part of them for years Yeah, mm. and it's made all the difference in the world in why we are alive and well today. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, 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 it goes back to scripture and Irene already said it, confess your sins to God that you may be forgiven, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. We got so many Christian leaders walking around forgiven and not healed because of their trust issues with people. Oh, wow. And I know this because I didn't want to be in a small group because I didn't know who was trusted because all of the wounds and betrayal of being a senior pastor, but how can trust issues be healed if we don't sacrifice what hurts, right? To, to for God to redeem it mm -hmm. through allowing someone else into our world, and so that's what we're always trying to do. And it's uh, uh, very honestly, it's an area we're tested in. Like I'll say, it's an area I'm tested in, mm -hmm. and uh, I think like I don't trust people easy. No. Uh, I trusted people too easy. That's the issue. And yeah. I didn't build community well, of a trusted, seen. of a trusted, you know, individual, a trusted couple. I've also learned that the same people that hurt us yeah. have the ability to, to heal, heal us. us. Mm. So it's like I, we made a decision. We'd rather trust and uh, choose to put our uh, neck out there and love than not have loved at all. It's great. <laughs> so, yeah. I mentioned the rawness of the book. There's a, a section um, in every chapter called the real talk section. It's my favorite part. <laughs> I I felt like I was like listening to you guys in the car talking to each other. Uh, talk to me about how you knew what to include in those parts. Because it, it's it's gritty, right? Like it's real. How how did you decide like, okay, we're, we're not going to put roses on any of this. We're just going to just going to lay it out there on the line. I think we are just doing what was done with us and me sitting in a counseling session and my counselor saying, you can't leave Irene with an attitude. Like I'm paying this lady to give me an attitude. Right. Mm. And, you know, and she <laughs> says, because the healed Irene won't have an opportunity uh, to, to, to take care of the wounds, redeem the wounds mm. or, or, or create a new normal that the old Irene created. I had another friend say, Jimmy, I'm sick and tired of hearing you complain about your wife. You'll never have the wife you want until you learn to love the wife you have. Like we had people say like, man, don't punk out, man. Like your marriage isn't over. Like, what are you going to tell your son if he asks you, did you do everything you could do to stay with mom? So I'm only doing in the book what was done to me. Like, this isn't from a place of judgment. This is from a place of humility that says it takes hard conversations to unearth difficult issues and dysfunction. That's it. We <laughs> wanted to bring people, yeah, like into that world of this is what it looks like to have honest thoughts and share them and have accountability. Absolutely. You guys break the book up into three different sections, love, laughter, and long longevity. L love and longevity were no brainers, right? Talk to me about the importance of laughter and that middle section. Well, I think a lot of marriages are plagued with uh, dysfunction, contagious dysfunction. And let me say it this way, or contagious attitude or contagious mm. anger. And we allow one problem in our marriage to consume our entire world. Mm -hmm. Like, just think about it. Your wife didn't cook dinner. Your husband, you know, left his underwear on the floor. It's really not that serious, but it becomes serious because we don't compartmentalize 
normality. That's all normal stuff, but put it to the side and not allow it to dominate the entire marriage. And honestly, I'm going to say it this way. We need to stop taking ourselves so seriously. Come on. And so I, I think for me is the joy of the Lord is our strength. Not that we get strength when we have, no, no. Joy produces strength. You do not need to be strong to have joy. That's not the equation. Joy, not happiness. Joy in your marriage, joy in your family. It will give you strength, right, in other areas. So we have to preemptively laugh. We have to preemptively date. We have to preemptively do what I call a Studebaker and I'm 50 years old and I'll pass gas under the sheets. And then when she gets in the bed at night, I love watching her face and just be totally Horrible. disgusted. I'm sorry. Couples suck at having fun. Yes. Okay. Okay. Agree. I love that. Right. And we, we call them a Dutch oven in our house, just so we're clear. Uh, but my wife's Dutch, so it just makes sense. Um, like right now, our dogs are scratching at the door. Guys, stop. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay so I, I have a dear friend of mine he, he's an engineer right and i know he's gonna listen to this podcast and um he's he's not he he just thinks about things so analytically yeah right like he he's one of the smartest guys i know H how does how do we get guys like that how do i get him to laugh more in his marriage and not take it because it feels serious yeah. 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 I think, again, it's going to take practice and intentionality. Like you're going to have to try new things, like go out, do different, um, I don't know, things that you've never done with your spouse. And then be, like when you, with the intention of like, make fun of each other in like, and be light about it, like go bowling and, you know, laugh at yourself when you mess up. Like I was the one who had a hard time having fun. Okay, I'm super serious. And then my model of marriage was not fun. Okay, it was kind of boring and stressful a lot of the time was the model I was presented. He was, she sucked at having fun. She, it was awful. Why like laughing about this. We shouldn't be laughing. Like it was like, I, it, you should, I was shitting all over us, right? Yeah. <laughs> shitting all over myself. Like don't laugh, but it, it's actually, now we have code words for sex. We've got code words for funny things just to make, break the ice in the mm -hmm. moment and make us laugh. Um, you know, can I say this? There's nothing like putting on an old slow jam and dancing in the house. Yeah. There's nothing like putting on, this is how we do it old school and doing the MC hammer in yeah. the house. Cabbage and here, and here's the deal. Like the, that guy who won't do that, that guy, he has definitely put the gifts over the spirit, uh, over top the fruit of the spirit. And mm -hmm. why are we so deep and we can speak in tongues and we can do all these things, but you can't laugh. Like what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his laughter? Yeah. Like, come on, man, <laughs> laugh. Stop taking yourself so seriously. Your kids can't stand you like laugh. And here, honestly, our kids, our family group chat is so, so many people would, if they saw it, would be so offended <laughs> because of how silly we are as a family. Yeah. Just, we didn't have that for so long. And now we have it and we do everything. Irene will say today, we're laughing. Or we'll say to her today, we're laughing. And she'll try to make us be serious. And I'm like, no, like you leave. Cause we're going to have fun. You like go mm -hmm. to the store. We're going to have fun. And no one, we have to stop taking ourselves so seriously. I don't know that we need an antidote. We, we need a, like, honestly, when you have experienced pain, there's nothing like laughing on the other side of that pain. Yeah. Just being goofy. We love it. <laughs> how, how old are your kids now? 23, 22 and 19. And they would rather spend time with us than be out and about, which is that tells you we're having fun. Absolutely. When you, so you guys have now um, you made a, a major life move to Dallas. You're at the end of this book tour as we record this. Like you guys have been in it. Like you guys are in a in a slog of work. Like it's a season of putting all this out here. What are some of your daily marital disciplines that you guys do to stay connected? Um, check ins. How are you doing? Super like high level. 
um, on a regular basis. It doesn't have to be planned or rehearsed. Literally just ask your, asking each other, how are you doing emotionally? How's your heart today? Um, when he gets home and he's exhaling, tell me what, what happened, what's, what's going on behind that exhaling. I know now, cause I've done the work that it's not personal towards me. Mm -hmm. So asking him more about, tell me more about that, getting curious about anything, whether it's spiritual, like what's God saying to you now? Um, what are you feeling, uh, emotionally? Did that bring something up for you from the past? Because I saw your whole um, um, facial expression change. No, tell me. And then I'm quiet. I'm just listening. I think one of the things that. That connection has been good for us. It's been real good. And I think I can sum it up. Like if I was preaching a sermon, I would say, give your spouse definition to your dysfunction. In other words, like it's dysfunctional that I huff all the time. Right. Like it's real. I'm exasperation. Right. It's dysfunctional that Irene can't pass to her face at times. And everything I say on certain days is like, like and her face I is think. cussing me out, even though she hasn't said a word. Right. But when she says, hey, I've had a rough day, I won't. My face might look off, but it has nothing to do with you. All she's doing is giving me dysfunction. I mean, definition. When I say, hey, uh, I'm tired, I'm probably going to huff a lot. Don't make it about you. Just pray for me. All we're doing is giving dysfunction. And these check-ins, like this morning, I couldn't sleep. I got up at five o'clock. I was laying on the couch. She came out and she goes, are you okay? I said, I got a lot on my brain. All I'm doing is telling her that today I want to arm you with uh, the ability to care for me well. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think we give our spouses the definition which arms them and prepares them for the ability to care for us well. Yeah. And so like yesterday I said, babe, I'm really tired. And she was like, well, I'll schedule uh, an IV for you to get an IV. Cause I think you're just dehydrated. All I did is when I said, I'm really tired now she's caring for me. Yeah. Yeah. So how simple are these things? They're simple. So beautiful. Yeah. And so, and so beautiful. So beautiful. Do you guys have weekly rhythms too, that you guys are like, I, I I was listening to you guys talk and I was like, the thing about um, marriages the, the, of a lot of the leaders that I talk to is they don't know when they're getting off course. Do you guys have some sort of like guardrails of like, like if you miss a check-in or two check-ins or mm -hmm. if you don't do date nights or if there's a long spell without physical intimacy, like how do you yeah. know when you're getting off the rails? So I know my husband, so I know what's important, in, right? So be real I, here, be real. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so he has to coach me in this part. Um, the like I I actually keep track of our sex. Yeah. So how many times we, we have a sex, sex calendar? Sex calender because Love that. we used to argue about that. Like he's like, it's been forever, and I'm like, um, two days. Like you know, that, that's forever. Since we Feels like forever time. to me. I'm I'm yeah, with right? you, Jimmy. I'm with you right? on that. I don't understand why, if it only takes two minutes, why are we waiting every two days? I, no one ever regrets means? it when it's over. Come on. <laughs> sorry, so, sorry. Side note. Keep going, Irene. I'm sorry. Yes. I got distracted now. So basically, um, where was I going? You were just talking about the rhythm of, you know, my husband's calendar, how you yeah. guys keep track calendar. and how you're trying to care for your husband. Yeah. So I'm like, and he knows that if, like, if I know that he's traveling, we try to make a deposit before he leaves. And then as soon as he comes back, we're making a deposit. And what I mean by deposit is it's connection. Yeah, yeah. I don't, it's on the couch with the dogs on our laps and we're Movie. no phone zone. Just yeah. look at it. Just talk. Um, sometimes we don't want to talk. So it's we're watching a movie, but it's like we're both in the same space, appreciating the quiet and like just connecting however we want to connect that day. And it's, if we are not intentional about that, we will get way too busy and suddenly we're in autopilot and it's robotic. And then you go to be intimate. And yeah. You're looking at each other going, who are you? Yeah. Uh, what are we doing? Like, and it's not meaningful and all of those things. So um, I think just staying in a rhythm of awareness. Yeah. If I start to notice that Jimmy's getting a little persnickety, mm. I like to call it. Uh, um, wow. Then I'm like, ooh, how how long has it been? Looking at my sex calendar. Mm. Um, 
you know, I, I'm checking in with myself. Have I given off vibes like, you know. But honestly, at 50 now, it's not even about the physical intimacy. It's like, are you being affectionate? Yes. Are yeah. you are you rubbing my shoulders? Can you scratch my back? Like it, like I, yeah, I feel like at 50, our roles have changed. I'm the female in the relationship now. Like I want to be held. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like, I do. <laughs> like it's just real. And I think knowing each other's in season changes, because a lot of couples are trying to like meet a need from an old season. Mm. Right. And it's like, no, I'm not 20 anymore. I'm not 25. I'm not 30 anymore. Like, I don't need to have, be physical, you know, uh, our intimacy, you know, uh, as often. But I do need you to ask me how I'm doing. I, I, I do need that. Yeah. I, I, I do need you to, to care. I do need you to say, you know, you know, how is that relation? I love the, the, we talked about earlier, the redemptive side of me and my son's relationship, you know, through all of this. And I love when Irene just says, you're being a great dad. Hmm. You know, like noticing the good things you do. Absolutely. That's like hitting a 300 yard drive right down the middle. Piping it. You know, that's so better good. than sex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I resented you for so long and it was like lived in that misery. So now it's like, I'm, I'm going to keep noticing the good stuff. Love me, woman. Yes. Affirm me. <laughs> Sometimes I, there's been seasons where I just thought, Hey, I, Hey honey, I need you to just tell me I'm doing a good job. Yeah. Like I just, I, when I get when I, when I preach, when I first started preaching, I used to come off the pulpit and be like, I don't want any feedback. I just need you to tell me I did a good job because real. I'm feeling real vulnerable and real raw mm -hmm. after that. Sometimes it's like, yeah. So I let's get, get tactical well, here. Can I tell Go you ahead. something right yeah. there? That's a really good skill. You asked your wife for what you needed. Great. You didn't just expect her to mind read. You're winning. What I was really trying to do, if I'm really honest, was try to prevent her from saying something critical. All right. <laughs> I love it. Well, good job. You protected yourself. I love it. Okay, let's let's get tactical here. Like so let's say that you're you've got a couple that came to you. They're sitting in front of you guys. Um, you know, let's say that they're both uh C suite executives, they're leading people, and they feel like they've just become um co co-business owners of their family they're i mean they're you know they're probably having sex once or twice a month but it's there's not a, a real connection they're just kind of going through the motions and just you know they woke up one day and they're like do i even know this person next to me if you're if you're talking to that couple what's the first thing i got it what's the first thing you're going to tell them to do what can they what's the first step I think what we'll do is go back and forth here. Just quick, quick, like what we do. First thing, uh, share an appreciation of your spouse. What have you noticed? What would you do next? I would um, affirm them and repeat back what I heard them say. So like just really making sure you feel heard. Yeah. So when you shared an appreciation, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you, why do you feel appreciated in that? I want to know the why behind the what. Right. So I can do it again. Okay. And then the next thing I'm going to do is, hey, take an internal inventory of what your scoreboard is in your life. Is is working and building a company more important than building your marriage? And mm -hmm. then I would follow up with this, because when you win at the wrong thing, you lose at the right thing. W what's another thing? Uh, are you emotionally healthy? These check-ins we're doing with our spouse, have you checked in with yourself lately? How am I doing emotionally? Because our success in business and relationships is not based off of a high IQ. Statistics say that we are going to be more um, successful in our relationships, marriages, and work when we're emotionally aware, intelligent, and healthy. Another one I would say is, is uh, we call it, do I have permission to read your mind? And it's a game, but it, hey, can I have permission to read your mind? And it would go like this. Irene, I think you think that when I huff and puff that I'm upset with you, right? That's and so good. I'm, I'm asking for permission to read your mind. And she can say no. And I can say, okay, we'll, we'll talk about it later. What's another thing we can do? 
uh, check your expectations of one another. Cause a lot of the time I, I ended up being resentful of you and I distanced myself from you. And that anger that was in me, I didn't realize was just simply being disappointed because I didn't have an expectation met, but it was my work to do because I had to check. Did I say it out loud? Was it realistic? Does he even know that I expect this? Where's this expectation coming from? Is it even healthy? Once I unpacked those things, then I, I had my own work to do and I could ask for what I needed and I wanted from you. And then the last one that we can just do because it's quick is remember when game, right? Mm. And so we would write down love, laughter, longevity. When was the first time in our relationship that you felt loved? Remember? I remember when, right? When is the, so when is, what was the funniest thing that has ever happened in our relationship? I remember when. It's the remember when game. And then what, when was the day that you felt like, man, I want to do life with this person for the rest of my life and have kids together? Remember when game. It's simple. Yeah. So good. That's so good. That stuff is so good. It's so practical. You can start installing that in your marriage today. Um, okay. I have one more question for you, but before I ask it, I know that my podcast family is going to want to connect with you all over the interwebs. Where's the best place to sign up for your coaching cohorts or to get a copy of the book or let's follow your podcasts. Well, uh, www.spell it out two equals one.com. And uh, you can sign up for our coaching. We are starting a yearly cohort with just pastors and leaders uh, on there. Um, right. So we're going to try to have a senior pass, a senior leader uh, cohort, and then a just, church worker called the ministry cohort. Uh, and you can walk with us through a year. Um, we even are inviting people in the cohort to travel with us as we travel and go preach and all that, mm. because some things are taught, some things are caught. I think the, the best things in life are caught. And so if you go to our website, but follow us on Instagram, I am Jimmy Rollins and uh, Irene Rollins. And then also we have Jimmy and Irene Rollins for, for just marriage stuff and buy the book and the workbook. And I'm telling you right now, this the workbook has space to write. You know, we, what we're seeing couples do is buy, uh, you know, one book and two workbooks. That's smart. Uh, to, to do the work. And and because, like, the guy is probably going to do uh, Audible because I can't – I'm not reading pages, but I'll listen to a book. Uh, and so this is available everywhere books are sold. Uh, and yes, right now it was the number one release in Christian marriage. Uh, Let's just, go. just throwing that out there. I'm not, yeah. no flexing. Humble uh, brag. Uh, you know, here's our pain. You know, our, if our pain could become a bestseller, I think that's pretty cool. But amen. Uh, and I just connect. That's it. All right. Uh, here's the last question I want to take you back to your wedding day, right? I, the, the morning of your wedding day. You're, you're not dressed yet. Maybe you're wearing those comfy clothes. You're probably getting hair and makeup done. Jimmy, you're probably chilling with your boys somewhere in the bottom yep. of the basement where we always put the grooms, right? Like the church basement. Like so, uh, And if you could go back in time and sit knee to knee with that younger version of yourself, hold their hand, look them in the eye, and give them one piece of advice about the journey they're about to go on, what are you going to tell them? You want me to go first or you want me to go first? first? I would tell Jimmy, you are not allowed to complain about the marriage that you refuse to work on. Shut your mouth and do the work. This isn't easy because mm. I thought it was going to be easy. I would tell the, my younger Irene, uh, Irene, God's going to reframe your shame. Wow. But you have to come out of hiding first. Wow. And it starts today. I wish that day I had come out of hiding and mm. just um, received the grace of God. I would have enjoyed life a lot more than when I was hiding in shame. I feel like we need a Nord keyboard right here. It's like a worship moment. You just went straight. Jesus, straight there, straight amazing. to it. I love it. It's you amazing. guys are my favorite. I appreciate you guys oh, so oh. much. Thank you so much for being generous and raw and vulnerable. I just that that realness is such a breath of fresh air. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you thank for you. having us. We enjoyed this so much. Hey, next next book. You guys are just 
just email me. You're back on it. I promise. You we, always we have an working, open invitation. We're working on something right now. I I know. I I knew it. I there was no doubt in my mind. 